All right. Patricia Schmidt, Patricia Schmidt. Hello, Dave Schmidt, I guess if you're there, hello as well. What I was explaining to the 600 people in class today, it's packed house, is that we're gonna be done today, no matter what, at 1.50 in 49 minutes, because I have a very, very important meeting. Did I mention that it's important? Over at, at the University of Idaho. And all jokes aside, actually, with lovely, lovely people. So very happy for that. But what I was saying was, I do not want you in this class ever sacrifice quality. Forgive me, everyone here live, who just heard me say this 10 seconds ago verbatim. If we have to, if we do not finish all the information today of today's lecture, it will carry over into Monday. That's no problem. We'll have more than enough time. The class is always running to 2.30, us finishing up at 2.10. We can make up whatever is lost today. Let's get started. Those people, they can come whenever they want. Um, don't care if they show up at all. All the important people are in class and on the Zoom, as far as I'm concerned, minus the Astons. I don't know where Barbara and Earl Aston are today. Hopefully they join us. But um, otherwise, everyone who who's important and matters is here. Okay, uh, lecture number 10. USA and CSA internationalism, Lee in the Army of Northern Virginia, Confederate Summer of 62, Emancipation Proclamation. Wow, a lot of stuff. Yeah, this is actually stupid on my part that I put all this into one lecture. This is a lot of information. I'll actually be happy to let it spill over to next class. Consider like this, like a, 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 an unbroken stream flowing in the telekinetic waves over the weekend. Um, and we'll pick back up on Monday with what we don't cover today. Where did we finish last class, my friends? Where, where did we finish? Anyone remember? You're a genius. G genius is genius. You're right. And you said the English for Amber. Yep, that's what we're going to talk about today. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, everybody. Where the were you guys? Okay, Peter was landing. Okay, ask me if I care about your excuses. I actually want you to ask me. <laughs> at, at, ask me. Just say, do, I, do you care about my excuses? Do you care about our I don't excuses? care. No, I do not. Really? Because what if they're really fun and good? Then there, I care less than. <laughs> um, what I was telling everyone now for the third time. Um, <laughs> no, you guys are the best. Honestly, thank you for being here for real. All jokes aside, thank you, thank you. Uh, what, we're not going to finish the whole lecture today. I have to leave for a meeting at 150, so we'll have 47 minutes. We always have a bunch of extra time at 2.30. This is going to cover over until next Monday. What we're covering today is Confederate and U.S. internationalism. We in the Army of Northern Virginia, the Confederate Summer of 62 and the Emancipation Proclamation, we left off as you correctly, perfectly, pinpoint perfect said, at the end of 1861, and the British were angry, right? Okay. First point of interest today, summer of 1861. Both Britain and France want belligerent status. What does that mean? Now, I'm right now talking about the international theater. Both Britain and France want belligerent status. Why? Hello, Barbara Aston and Earl Aston. Mean they what? want to be belligerent or they want the US? They want the, no. So the Europe, uh, and this, you're, you're being very clear. I'm being opaque. I'm sorry. I was uh, posing the question wrong, perhaps. Uh, the Confederate agents are seeking, the Confederate agents are going to Europe, with their hat out, hat in hand, asking France and Britain to grant them coveted belligerent status. I don't want to impregnate the answer too much and say the next thing and you're like, oh, that's what it is. Belligerent status versus what? What do they the not want? Sorry? Rebel. Exactly. Brilliant. It's exactly what I'm looking for. Oh. Diplomatic language might be kind of flaky and amorphous and all that, and that's fine. But if Britain and France say that the Confederates are rebels, they are implicitly, maybe explicitly agreeing with the United States of America. You're right. You, Abraham Lincoln, are exactly correct. They're just tre treasonous rebels. But conversely, as Hunter correctly said, if France and Britain say the Confederates are belligerent, they are now implicitly slash explicitly agreeing. There's two separate countries there. And you can't be on the fence. Depending upon if the Confederates are rebels or traitors or whatever you want to call it, or belligerents, it's an internal civil strife, like the US wants to say, these stupid redneck guys who broke away, they're, they're, they're traitors. Or, no, 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 the Confederates, maybe we're still going to be neutral, but they're belligerents. They're a separate country. All right. November 8th, 
1861 is going to be very, 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 very problematic. Very problematic indeed. Because they're going to try to find how far pi goes out. They're trying to find it to the thousand place. Very problematic, literally a math problem. You guys get it. Um, that's not what it's about at all. Um, I hear the exhale of frustration over here. I deserve it for that. Uh, November 8th, 1861, the Trent Affair. We're gaining towards that in a second. Let me actually begin with some background information. If today, in what I titled this lecture, the international dimension plus, um, the international dimension plus uh, Lee and Sharpsburg Antietam and Emancipation Proclamation, if we don't get to the domestic stuff till next class, that's fine actually. I wanna get the international stuff first. Because in fact, actually, it goes backwards to 1861. The, the domestic stuff is already 62. If we cover that Monday, it's great. And actually, final pat on the back, we are two classes ahead. If you see the syllabus, there's supposed to be a quiz. We didn't do a quiz, and we didn't do a game in the class. So we have all the time in the world. Hooray. <laughs> what is, I promise we'll do the game. I will, but we have to go. The game is absolutely, even when it's serious, it's nonsense. So we have to do the serious stuff first. What is the view from Europe? Well, conservatives, by that I mean often like autocratic people, sympathize with the South. They look at the South as like the true Christian, almost feudal Europe section of America. They are very, very content to say, and also say, hence why here where we've been talking the whole class and I've said, slavery is the prime cause of the war, the most important issue. Fine, here's a counter against that. The South is like, the people in Europe who are all basically anti-slavery are like, they both have slavery. It's legal everywhere. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's a mutually neutralized issue. Right? Look at the issue over Roe versus Wade and the Mississippi case before the Supreme Court. You can imagine even a very, very pro-life country somewhere in the world being like, well, it doesn't matter if like Massachusetts is pretty pro-abortion in California and Mississippi is not. It's legal everywhere in America. We're kind of putting that on the, on the back burner. And that's what Europe does with the U.S. The U.S., I now i am speaking like Lincoln, the whole country, including the Confederacy, with, with America, the people who are more conservative in Europe say, the Southern section is more Catholic, more Christian values, maybe even like Protestant values, right? Mm -hmm. Protestant Europeans of the conservative bent. The South has respect for family, tradition, whatever. The North, they're like super crazy progressives. And not a lot has changed in those kind of the ways people look at them. And indeed, indeed, liberals in Europe, especially people like Mazzini and then Garibaldi later on, and these guys, Young Italy, and they want to resort, who want to, um, take the papal lands away and create secular Italy, they're really big into Lincolnism. They're big into the Republicans. They're like, yeah, this is what we want to do in Europe. Pius IX, uh, he's a big bad tyrant guy. And um, that might immediately think, well, why wouldn't they favor the Confederacy? Because they would say Pius is like the Southern guys. He's this, you know, really, these are purposely anachronistic terms, but he's like the patriarchy, that kind of stuff, right? Literally, Papa, papal, patriarchy, right? Go ahead. Uh, so the 19th century is also just like, that's the rise of nationalism in, in Europe. That's really where nationalism starts to begin being a thing. In okay. A form, right? Yes. What, right. continue. In terms of like unifying people along linguistic grounds, along cultural grounds, saying those should be nations like Italy, the unification of Italy, or the, I guess the continued, um, unification of German peoples and the Prussians uh, getting away from the Holy Roman Empire, uh, the French effort towards unifying the language after the revolution in the Napoleonic era, um, and making it so there's not like these different, because when we think of French nowadays, and Dr. Russian you know a lot more mean on this, Parisian French is what we think of when we think of French, but in the beginning of the 18th of the 19th century, Parisian French is a minority of French of France. Uh, the, there's there's other subgroups of French and even things that really aren't properly French that are being spoken in southern France and western France and eastern France. But I guess that I don't know. I'm just going to bring some global context. Preach on. You're bringing like you're dumping maple syrup all over the pancakes. Just like continue, like go with it. The perfect, brilliant. A couple, yeah, let's talk about Europe in a second with that context Ryan provided. I hope everyone can hear it on Zoom adequately well. At least Betsy Johnson, hello. Ryan, everything you said was correct. 
the 19th century is indeed the century of nationalism. I've suggested before you, to you guys, Imagined Communities by Benedict Anderson, a book written in 1983. It's a great book. It, it argues that like a nationalism, especially on, uh, Betsy, you write, I can hear Ryan. Um, do you want an award for that? Uh, heard it all. Uh, I'm very glad, Betsy, thank you. Heard it all, thanks from Earl Aston. Mm. Yes, you do, Betsy. Betsy, every time that I try to come at you in like a linguistic battle, I always get my butt kicked by you. You're, you're my superior in every way. I want to just admit that for forever. Like I never can take you on in a, in a like one-on-one. -on -one. I'm always getting destroyed, but it's okay. You win again. Yes, you say you want an award. I can't provide the award now, I lose. I shouldn't have made the joke. I look like a liar. So thank you for exposing my hypocrisy. Um, Imagined Communities by Benedict Anderson. And he argues, as Ryan Alexander said, that nationalism has grown, born around a common language, census, borders on a map. Cartography is important, of course, but even things like the museum. Like you go to this museum and you see like what our artifacts are and what, why we matter as a people and great men and great women of our history, et cetera, et cetera. Where is nationalism really born though? What battle and what, who births nationalism? Where is this? It's really important actually. The Battle of Valmy in 1792. When the French repelled the Austrians trying to put down the revolution and then they write the Marseillaise. Anyone want to sing that song? Nos enfants de la patrie, le jeu de glory est arrivé. Yeah, it's freaking awesome. It's uh, at the end of the song. Aux hommes des citoyens. They're like, uh, <laughs> and there's one about the impure blood uh, of yeah. our fields. Yeah, yeah, like, uh, que sang impure s'approuve des notions. Yeah, till the blood of our enemies, the impure blood of our enemies waters our fields. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that, that got dark very, very fast. I'm sorry, guys. But it's all Ryan Alexander's fault. He wanted to bring, he wanted me to sing the song. What is this, Casablanca? By the way, <laughs> okay, go ahead. So bring us, sorry, bring us back on topic. The reason why the conservatives are interested in Confederacy is because the Confederates, in a certain sense, are anti-nationalist movement. The conservatives in the 19th century are going to be anti-nationalists. They're going to be the odd the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and people are saying, look, we can have the Austrians and the Hungarians and all these other little pockets of people in Czechs and the Czechs in different in different ethnic groups under the same country, and we're gonna be a, we're gonna be okay. And it's not, it's certainly not multiculturalism as we imagine it, because there's still like defined borders about where people are, but it's there's not this idea that oh if yeah, like we need to have all the Hungarians in one place and all the Austrians in one place. If you look at maps of ethnic maps of Europe in this time before World War One, especially World War Two, there's like little pockets of Germans and Czechs and Slovenians and all sorts yeah. of things going yeah. on. But I don't yeah, know. So, so how does this? But wait, I don't understand why the South is perceived that way. Well, Perceived as a, a conglomerate Austro-Hungarian style empire because there yes, be... because the North would also have a bunch of different groups together. That, that's what I'm arguing is that despite the cultural heritage of both the North and the South, the shared heritage of England, it's the conservative view would be to say, oh, it, it's okay to have like very American but also different groups that have different nations on in North America. Because the South, oh, the South wants land. to be state. Yeah, right. Because they want the space. They want to have self-rule, just like but that would seem to me to be more in conjunction with nationalism. No. Why not? Because it's it's yeah. more traditional. Okay. Uh, nationalism. Yeah. Nationalism. It might be from American. Go for it. I think you maybe have a different definition. A different definition of nationalism. I have a book suggestion for you. Read Twilight of the Habsburgs. I don't know who the author is, but super good. It talks about like, yeah, the, when the Tremisil falls in 1915, they have to read the Declaration of Surrender in like 11 different languages. It's a great polyglot austro hungarian empire. All that is good. The last, whoever's joining the Zoom, Betsy, I think you came on recently. I have to be done at 1.50 today. I have a meeting at two o'clock. So this will carry over to next class. Um, so we're going to be all business today as we've been. Thank you for excellent stuff. One question I have. That's not all business. How good looking was Ingrid Bergman on a scale of one to 10? 40, 65? No idea who that person um, Eight. Eight, Seven. what? Ingrid Bergman, 65 out of 10, no. right? I know. I'd say eight, yeah. She's what about, okay, she's Ingrid Bergman versus Audrey Hepburn. 
Oh, well, Audrey Hepburn can't carry Ingrid Bergman's high heels. Ingrid Bergman all the time. <laughs> can't carry her what? Her high heels. <laughs> if anyone wants to, I'm going to keep going with the real information in the class, but uh, if anyone wants to weigh in on how good looking Ingrid Bergman, only very positive answers allow it on my chest. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, so, all right, seriously. Excellent. All this stuff, excellent. All right. Listen to what Alan Nevins says. He's a historian. Alan Nevins, book, War of the Union. No battle, not Gettysburg, not the wilderness was more important than the contest waged in the diplomatic arena in the form of public opinion. All right, there's also a book, if you're interested, anyone interested. Blackburn is the author. It's a book about uh, correspondence in newspapers, periodicals at that time, opinions on the war. Let's be as simplistic as possible. All of you people, not a fake compliment, are brilliant. You can handle the most complex stuff. But just to be as simple as possible, especially introducing a theme for the first time, it basically broke down that in Europe, if you were more conservative and more kind of like maybe outwardly, like you, know, you wanted a Catholic monarchy, whatever, you would sympathize with the South. Very uncomfortable facet for some like super northern woke Catholics, how much Catholics in Europe love the Confederacy. Uh, Pope Pius IX, we'll talk about him later in the class, sent a crown of thorns to Jefferson Davis and was like, you're also suffering for like the righteous cause. And we're not allowed to talk about that. It actually didn't have, it's fake news. We'll talk about it later. Yeah, right? We didn't learn about this in CCD class. Um, in, in, in Europe, people, especially inheritors of the 1848 revolutions. What are the 1848 revolutions? Well, they tried to be like the French Revolution, liberty, fraternity, equality, water the soil of our enemies with their entrails, and they fail. The 1848 revolutions, Ryan Alexander perfectly described this age, the 19th century is the age of nationalism, liberalism, socialism. 1848 is the year Communist Manifesto is authored. As those revolutions sweep over Europe, they fail everywhere. Cavignac in France fails, Mazzini in Italy fails. Um, Wilhelm, the, the king at that time, is offered by the Frankfurt Parliament, these, these liberal guys, who, Republicans, they're like, why don't you be our king? And he literally says to them, I will not accept the crown of clay. Get the F out of my face. Oh, you got peasants. Right. right. And so he's like, you guys are just disgusting. And, and all of the kind of in, in the, the Pan-Slav conference, talk about Czechs and Slovenes and, Pol and Poles wanting uh, self-determination. That fails. Everything fails. The success is long-term. If this, the, the same failure in France, and then you get the, the joke of Napoleon, um, you know, Napoleon III, and all that will lead to La Belle Epoque in France, like the, the great French liberalism and Laicity in 1905 and all this kind of stuff. This is now getting off topic in, historically, not Ingrid Bergman style, but still off topic. Let's focus here. Basically, just keep that in mind. If you were a conservative person, a newspaper editor, or conservative politically, you probably favored the South. If you were um, progressive, liberal, you were for the North, often. All right. The U.S. never signed the Declaration of Paris of 1856 outlawing privateering, okay? So there is just the, the kind of like small boats and different kind of the, the, the questions, the blockade, which by the way, is the blockade is set up in the water. It's very, very weird because for international law to say it's justified, a blockade had to be what? Blank. Your blockade is illegal unless it's what? It's a very weird term, unless it's effective. Meaning I can't put your face in the mud unless your whole face is in the mud. It's not like, it's not like, don't put my face in the mud. It's like, if you're gonna do it, it's gotta be right. If I'm putting your face halfway in the mud, it's an illegal action. If the blockade is kind of just a joke and like put it clustered up and whatever, for a blockade to be considered illegal by our national standards had to be done properly. I still don't know what the reason was for this. Because otherwise it would just be an excuse for piracy, or just, is that what you're saying? Yeah, that would be kind of like a porous, it's almost like, yeah, like if you're gonna build a wall to block something off, you might get more problems with being a crappy wall, people, whatever. You're gonna build a wall, build a wall that's just like boom, no one can come. It serves the purpose, or don't build one at all, like kind of stuff. Um, and this is actually nothing to do. That I'm not. I don't want this comment to be interpreted. It's nothing to do with like Trump and the wall on the Mexican border. I mean, you can take anything I say on any rabbit hole you want. I'm just saying that's not what I was getting at. Um, for better or for worse, I just mean like maybe be like the city comes to you and says you're like I want to build a fence to me and my neighbor's property. And like okay, but the rule is you're gonna build a fence that has to be totally enclosed. If you're going to do a shizzle show job and like falling half apart, it's going to look like garbage and we're going to be, we're going to find you. So either leave it as it is or do it right kind of thing. The U.S. blockade is going to be this kind of like complete slack together, blah, 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 whatever. This is the one with Jefferson? Under Jefferson? No, this is already Winfield Scott, the Anaconda plan, the oh, kind of the big blockade in the Atlantic Ocean is supposed to 
totally down in New Orleans, hypothetically, it doesn't, right. it's not this good, but just block off the South, forbid them from intercourse so economically. Like the turtle, the old gravity turtle. Yeah. There's a guy, I saw, I saw things, speaking of turtles, I saw a guy as a prank, he put a, a snapping turtle on a stick uh -huh. and walked around and like poke people with it. So guys like, oh, because like the turtle like bit someone in the knee and you said a turtle taped to a stick, which is first of all, definitely animal abuse. You can't tape a turtle to a stick and use it as a frog, but it was pretty funny. I don't think it, I don't think it hurts the turtle. I don't think, the turtle was angry to me. I think the turtle didn't like it, his head stuck into someone's arm. That's why he bit the guy. Yeah, I think he didn't carry these on the stick. Uh, okay. Was this in high school or junior high? Or? This is on YouTube yesterday. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't Patali. I didn't do this. Patali, who's that? Frank, Frankster. He's a prankster. I've never heard of this guy. Um, no, it wasn't. I it was. Um, <laughs> I forget what it was. Some kind of things. Walk softly and carry a big turtle, Dave Schmidt. <laughs> Dave, Dave, you're a man amongst men. Thank you for that. My only regret is you're not in class to actually share this was, live. What's the, the embargo that I'm thinking? Was that under Jefferson or was that under a different? Thomas Jefferson? Yeah. I know there is stuff like with when uh, in the wake of the um, the Kentucky Virginia resolutions and the kind of like the, 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 the weird war with France I mean, under John Adams, there is some stuff that it, yeah. there is a non intercourse act in 1807 leading up. I'm not sure how, how it relates identically. What a compare and contrast me. There was some embargoes leading up to the, the world of 1812 in the Jeffersonian presidency. Um, there's literally something called the Non Intercourse Act of 1807, which is preventing trade between Europe and America. I don't know right. what. Which year was that? 1807, I think. So it was even like in half a decade before the, before the war then. Who was president? Jefferson. He's 1801 Jefferson. to 09. That's what I was saying. Yeah, about. exactly. Okay, then maybe that's it. Okay, so the blockade's not great. We, we know what the Europe is sympathizing, right? First big event, May 14th, 1861, Great Britain proclaims neutrality. France follows on June 10th, okay? May and June, all right, they have now implicitly at least, like wink, wink, granted the Confederacy belligerent status. We're proclaiming neutrality. To even say we're proclaiming neutrality is to acknowledge there's two parts. Uh, if something was going on, if there's an insurrection in America, like in Iowa or something, no one would be like, if Macron, the French president, would be like, oh, I'm, I'm neutral. Like, what are you talking about? It's a bunch of like crazy people in Iowa. Already to say we're neutral implies already we're accepting what the, Confed the Confederacy is overjoyed. Remember last class, we said all the Confederacy does is win the first year of the war, minus Fort Sumner, stupid move. It's a victory, but it undercuts the diplomatic position. Um, Confederacy, though, wins at Fort Sumner, crushing victory at first Manassas, so much that Horace really wants to quit, like Lincoln should surrender now. Uh, this is now even better news, internationally speaking. May 14th, June 10th, we're now a month, June 10th is a month before first Manassas. I can see how you're putting the timeline together in your head. Keep doing that. It's exactly, I want you guys to have these theaters in order. We're going to have basically three theaters in this war. The Eastern, which is Virginia-based in that area, the Western, Mississippi, they'll eventually combine with Sherman coming down, this famous uh, March to the Sea and all that. But basically the east and the west and then um the international theater there is fighting sporadically in texas even in new mexico and things we're not gonna that's just too much information we won't be able to cover it all but keep those three theaters in mind kind of virginia mississippi if you want to just use, even use like cities like if you want the eastern theater to be gettysburg and antietam great if you want the western theater to be like vicksburg and the trans mississippi area cool um the international theater before we get started first manassas in northern virginia on july 21st britain and france have said you guys they go into that battle with that confidence. We're, we're accepted, kind of. I didn't see that running that great. Awesome. For France, for France, they have this to say, okay? America desires no European role. American naval power does not exceed parity with the British. The geopolitical interests of France and the U.S. are compatible in the hemisphere. That is the only reason the French don't go full bonkers pro-South, okay? For them, actually, see, it depends. It's on the eye of the beholder. Confederacy is like, oh, you guys love us. France is like, we don't, well, we kind of love you. We're not ready to propose though, because for us, it's worth it to be in good relations with it. We're not, this ticks off America. It would really piss them off if they go full, like we're going to wave a Confederate flag, like stars and bars in, in Paris. They're not going to do that. They are saying it's not. That, that could be the title of the song, Stars and Bars in Paris. Get on the piano, go for it. By the way, my Sophia, I apologize for having you come to class today because I have to finish class at 150. So I'm sorry. You'll have 25 minutes of this. Okay. It is what it is. My, my deepest apologies. Dave Schmidt already crushed the joke. 
He made a uh, Theodore Roosevelt said famously, um, speak softly and carry a big stick. And Dave Schmidt said, speak softly and carry a big turtle. And it was a reference to, I, say, I said, some guy, some like frat guy probably, duct taped a turtle to a pole and was walking around poking people with the turtle. Turtle didn't want his head into someone's ribs and he'd bite the guy at the ribs. Hilarious, right? Like, oh, and it's a snappy turtle. Dave Schmidt, Dave Schmidt <laughs> winning. But, but, but winning. you're not aware of the turtle cartoon that I was talking about for the Jefferson Embargo? Because O grab me is embargo spelled backward. Oh, so they have this no. turtle called the O grab me that represents oh, no. embargo. And then I might like, snap and throws like I'm like, not aware of that. Send it to me. Please send it to me. I'll, I'll put it. I need to have I need to have a slideshow for you guys. Oh, by the way. Oh, oh, oh okay. Uh, I don't know who that is. Let's get back on topic. Right, let's get back. Yeah, that's safe. safe. <laughs> Okay, so does everyone does everyone understand this? Okay, that it's a big win for the Confederacy. They have reached belligerent status. That's Sophia, that's where you're coming in right now. We're talking the international theater. The South has won belligerent status versus the Europe saying they're rebels. Europe, uh, May 14th, 1861, Britain grants proclaims neutrality on June 10th, 1861, a month before first Manassas, France says we're neutral in the war. This is a big victory for the South because they want Europe to acknowledge their independence. They kind of are tacitly, implicitly. What is American diplomacy? Um, US diplomacy is all about staving off Great Britain and France, not just supporting the South, but uniting in support of the South. Lincoln is going to tell all his envoys, just keep them from supporting them. If they do, our goose is cooked. Because all of you Revolutionary War geniuses, remember why America won the war? Because it was like written contra mundum in 1781. Even the Dutch, who are so irrelevant, it's impossible to even like comment on. It's like, uh, oh, so who, who, you guys, who do you guys got going into war with you? The Dutch. Oh, so you're going solo. <laughs> <laughs> even the Dutch joined against the British, I think, at one point. The, the Americans do not want to repeat that. Remember, there's more people at Yorktown French people to get Cornwallis to surrender on behalf of the, of the colonists than their American troops. The French save our goose at Saratoga in 1777. So very simple. The whole point of US diplomacy is prevent America, prevent Britain and France from supporting the Confederacy and from doing it together. We don't want to repeat the Revolutionary War. Okay, so before I talk about the economic side, once more, Sophia, for you as well, Sophia, I am happy to recap anything for you, always, without, without a problem. Um, basically, we said if you're any if you're conservative, Catholic, a monarchist in Europe, you support the South. See that as a more traditional point. That goes for leaders and also people in the media. If you're more liberal, progressive, you're more likely for the North. The USA never signed this thing called the Declaration of Paris, outlawing privateering. There's a question about the blockade being effective. Are you going to be able to run through it? Who knows? And then the last stuff I just told you about neutrality. What about the economic side? This is important. Between 1820 and 1860, Great Britain gets 75% of its cotton from the U.S. South. And with the, with the bumper crop of 1860, a very good crop, it goes up to high as 85%. All of this breeds a dual attitude of arrogance in the South that European recognition, European recognition will be quick and easy. All we have to do is say, you guys, you granted us belligerent status. Come on, fly that flag. Come all the way, propose. We will say yes, show us the ring. Come all the way. And if they're like, no, they're like, no, that's enough for us. France, remember three conditions. We want to stay with, uh, we, we, we don't want to make America too mad, okay? If they do nonsense like that, all we have to say is fine, the cotton's over. We're turning the cotton spigot off. Early Confederate diplomacy literally was king cotton diplomacy. There's a guy who's so baller, maybe one of the best Southern historians of all time named Frank Owsley. That was a legend. Could freestyle rap about anything on top of a hat, which was unique for the 1930s. Um, <laughs> he, should have, he would roast people. Like you walk in your outfit, he would just like destroy you. And he have his, his guy, the secretary of his office would beatbox. <laughs> that is amazing. Frank Owsley wrote a book called King Cotton Diplomacy. I think as a civil war historian, it's maybe one of the best books written in Civil War history. Really, it's amazing. It's, it, it so punches in the face. People are like, oh, but it's written in 1930. Uh, what about someone who wrote something at Yale in 2019? It's, it's still unsurpassed. The book, again, is called King Cotton Diplomacy. And Owsley tells you in 600 pages what I'm going to tell you now in five minutes. That basically, the South, when they enter the war, I can't explain to you how blinded they are by this. 
Their whole diplomacy is King Cotton. All I have to tell you, Sophia, Queen of France, is you don't want to support us? No cotton. And my answer to everything you say is just no cotton. No cotton, no cotton. We'll see why this fails. Hunter had an early point earlier in the semester when he talks about the alternate sources, Algeria, India, all this kind of stuff. Right. British Empire comes in very handy here. We'll be able to we'll get our cotton from elsewhere. We prefer it from the South, it's the most convenient, the best crop, whatever. But uh, this, this backfires in the South, obviously. Spoiler alert. The South never gets recognition from Europe, ever in the world, ever, except from the Pope. <laughs> that another like the Pope literally writes to Davis. I will read you this letter later in the, in the semester, in a couple of weeks. Most illustrious president, Jefferson Davis. That's how he salutates it. And Davis is like, I'm I'm a made man. Like, that's my big record deal. Like the Pope just said I'm president. Davis was an Episcop Davis was an Episcopalian who was um, in his formative years educated by Benedictine priests somewhere in Kentucky or Tennessee. He's from Kentucky, but somewhere there in the, somewhere in the place that's like too disgusting to even talk about. So we'll move on. Uh, <laughs> probably somewhere like Arkansas, some place like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love the South so much. I really do. I, if anyone doesn't like the South, you're a horrible person. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, the Pope is the only person who will actually recognize um, Davis, but Judah P. Benjamin and some of these more like clear-headed thinkers are like, mm, it's really kind of just the form. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, an, it's a nice thing. He just, he's, it's a paper tiger act. He's not going to actually literally help you. By the way, P.S., the Pope has his own problems with, mm -hmm. with uh, you know, uh, people trying to, Italian. Italian unification. Thank you. Exactly. Okay. So King Cod diplomacy. All right. What happens when the people show up to talk to the Europeans. Well, the first mission, the first mission, my friends, is the Yancey Man Roast mission. Okay, Ambrose Dudley Mann is a Confederate diplomat. He's the only guy who's actually like kind of a decent diplomat. This guy Roast is, is Pierre Roast is selected only because he speaks French. Um, whatever, get in line. Like everyone speaks French in France. That's your only qualification. <laughs> Why did you hire this person's job? Because he's a human being. Oh, I assume that much. What can you do? He's a person. He's a person, darn it. Are you denying his humanity? I'm asking you, what can you do for the job? So Rose speaking French is like, oh, big freaking deal, dude. He probably spoke with the worst gringo accent too. So it's like, whatever. Yancey gets selected. Yancey is freaking uh, fire eater guy. Okay, so he has zero credibility. Like he's going to go yell at the Europeans. How dare you uh, recognize us? This mission totally fails immediately. Surprise, surprise. Because Yancey arrogantly postures about Southern rights in the meeting of secession without realizing the hypocrisy of the South firing first on Fort Sumner. Okay, this is the original, like, <laughs> get rid of this legislation. And they show you the tweet. Sophia says that. Let me show her. Sophia, you tweeted, I support this legislation with my whole heart like eight months ago. And you're like, I guess I can start the apology tour. Yancey goes in this first mission, Confederates go and they have a lot on their side. They're supplying 85% of the cotton. That, that's, that's a lot. That's good in terms of like trying to win support. But Yancey doesn't realize the maybe the best, I don't know, anyone know who Sergei Lavrov is? Anyone know who that person is? Anyone's heard of Sergei Lavrov? No, nobody? I've heard of him. Is that the current Russian? He's the Russian foreign minister. He's probably, people say he's probably the most talented diplomat in the world in terms of like what diplomacy is. I mean that like He's the best pianist, the best violinist. I mean, it's the art of diplomacy. Lavrov is very, very good at like, okay, you're Anthony Blinken, our Secretary of State. We have different interests, whatever, a way of like flattering you without kissing your butt, making you see my point of view. I want to bring to my side, but also cautiously. These guys had none of that ability. They had no, diplomacy is the art, of, really what diplomacy is ultimately, I think, is the art of interpersonal relations. How do you meet someone? It's, it's, Yancey went and like scolded them and people were just like middle finger dude get out of here like go back to America I'm not the opposite just as bad he goes there oh esteemed highness oh you know on the feet like it's not about being a sycophant the art of diplomacy is finding the, the kind of right balance of like being firm but respectful whatever these guys sucked at this Yancey just goes full like you guys need to recognize us we're the best they're probably like what is they're, they're, the people in France are probably like Eugenie was probably like what the hell is he saying like I have no English. He sounds like he has like crawdads in his mouth. Like tell him to take the corn cob pipe out of his mouth before he tries to speak <laughs> and record again. Um, it just totally fails. Okay, the first mission completely fails, but it fails because of this guy's attitude. Fine, but it fails as well 
because by 1861, India is supplying one third of the cotton imports to Britain. Britain is tapping into their uh, imperial leviathan, their hegemony over the whole part of the world. The, the sun never sets in the British Empire. And they're like, we don't need you guys anymore. We don't need you guys double anymore. Because guess what? One third, I'm not great at math. 33% is less than 85%. Everyone understands that on that, right? right? It's, the, it's the place where the, the, the sign eats the bigger number. It's 33, then eat that guy who's eight pi. That's bigger, I think. That's not making up, obviously, it, it almost is a full third. It's almost, 85 is close to close enough to 100%. Then what is the real mathematical proportion of that? 40, 45%, I don't know. It's, it's not enough to cover it. But here's the cool thing. Why did I say the cotton imports into Britain went from 75 to 85 in 1860? Why? Because of what? Who remembers? There's a bumper crop. Yes, sir. There's a bumper crop. That means there's tons of cotton being in the storehouses in Europe. So the positive thing for the South, having less cotton, becomes something bad for them. Because now all of a sudden, if the replacement isn't simply one third Indian cotton, it's maybe an extra 20% from what should become next year saved. And there's all then Britain is also getting alternate sources from Northern Africa, Algeria, especially Egypt, Egypt as well. It's Algeria. Algeria. Is, oh, oh yeah, but but I okay. But at this point, think about one of the big things that enabled Britain to in the Victorian era to rule the whole kind of maritime economy was there was no restrictions on them having economic so, relations with the French. So maybe the French are the one getting the large cut or whatever, they're still supporting it back there now. Maybe the French are like, oh, we'll take advantage of supplying the cotton from our colonies to, to London. All right. But they did start cultivating a lot of Egyptian cotton, which is still very famous. Right. The civil, US exactly, civil. exactly. A, a mother, the necessities, the mother of all inventions, right. Okay, so does everyone understand that? So this, this maybe is the first big Confederate loss of 1861, is that, uh, this is when the chickens come home to roost while he's going on and on about you guys need to recognize us no matter what what people the europeans are saying back to yancey especially is not only are you an arrogant loudmouth this is so disrespectful you don't know how to do this what are you a terrible diplomat and in fact davis himself deserves fault davis also bought into king cotton diplomacy he's like i don't have to nominate talented people brian alexander everyone's telling me he's a great diplomat he's a very smart guy he's a famous lawyer uh I don't care. He's not my friend. I'll nominate my, I'll do my like, you know, nepotism picks. That's what Davis does. Because why do we need his economic, why do we need his talent? There's no, it's just going to say King Cotton, Fawcett, as simple as that. They all bought into this. So a real diplomatic spade work was put to the side. But they also say to them, not only are you an arrogant loudmouth, we still want to have anything to do with you because of that period. Also, you're an idiot. You're constantly claiming that you're being aggressed by big, bad, scary wolf guy Lincoln. You guys fired first. Reminder. You guys fired first. We heard the story. You guys fired the first shots of the war. Shut up about being the victim. You started it. You're the kid on the playground. I pushed the kid first and punched him and then whined about it. So the mission is a massive epic failure. We'll talk a lot about diplomacy in this class. Again, we're going to have three theaters. We're going to come back to South. Remember, you're going to see what the Pope says. You're going to be scandalized. The Pope says to Davis. Um, he basically is like, let's go grab beer sometime and watch football. They get really close. Um, <laughs> Davis like football. You guys like soccer. You mean like real football or that? And folks like, Ooh, like, but go AC Milan, and they they fall they fall out over that. Uh, on last thing we we'll talk about today's class, then we're done. So I have to go to this meeting. I told you guys about that, right? Like forty times. I want to keep talking about it to annoy you. Like, shut up about the meeting already. We know. Um, so I have to go to this meeting in eleven minutes with Sergey Lavrov. <laughs> with Sergey Lavrov. Um, <laughs> Okay. Kidding. Censors on Zoom. He's uh, not actually. He's not. Censor. He's not meeting with. Uh, 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 <laughs> redact that. Uh, um, November eighth, eighteen sixty-one. The hot point of internationalism in the war. The biggest, a thing that's a massive loss for the Union becomes a huge Confederate missed opportunity. November eighth, eighteen sixty-one. Union Captain Charles Wilkes. This is the Trent Affair, by the way. I ended class last class talking about Trent Affair. I didn't look at my syllabus, said, oh, we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks. It's today. Awesome. On November 8, 1861, Union Captain Charles Wilkes, commander of the USS San Jacinto, stops the British mail boat, emphasis on British, RMS Trent, emphasis on neutral, in the Caribbean, it's en route to, to, to London by way of St. Thomas, and he removes Confederate agents, John Mason, John Slidell. He takes them prisoner and then allows the boat to go on its way. Britain freaks out rightfully so they're like we can have anyone we want we can have the easter bunny the tooth fairy on our ship uh we're neutral 
You guys can't stop our boat. Yeah, Confederate skies are on here. Why is that? It's not your business. There, this is a safe zone. This is British soil, whatever. Uh, Confederate agent Ambrose Dudley Mann, remember him? The only good agent of the three. He writes from London on December 2nd, 1861, quote, there is a probability our recognition by her Britannic Majesty's government will not much longer be delayed. He adds, Britain would punish the so-called, the, the, the French word is really called cool, soi-disant, the so-called, the soi-disant United States, for their flagrant violation of the integrity of her flag upon the high seas. Her voice will now be found in her sword. Britain orders the U.S. to formally apologize. And uh, they, they release the Confederate prisoners, and then Lincoln goes full epic back to diplomacy. Historians still don't know what he said to the British. But the British, with their sword drawn, like Manley says, about to do what? About to go full. We're on the side of the Confederacy. You guys, you guys Fort Sumter'd us, right? The South fired on Fort Sumter. You guys fired on our stuff. We're, um, we're going to be involved in the Confederate side. The crisis passed. Sadly, a big reason the crisis passes is because Queen Victoria, her husband, Prince Albert, dies at this time. Very true love story. If you don't know, Victoria never, never remarried, not only never remarried, for the remainder of her life, she always set his clothes out in the morning. He's like an act of mourning. She never got over his death. They had like nine children, really beautiful love story. Albert dies, I think of some consumption or something, um, maybe something else, but something, uh, God rest his soul. All of Britain, despite Victoria, yes, being a paper monarch, this is way past 1688, all of Britain is focused on that. And they're like, it's just, just F these people, like the, the Americans, like South, okay, you guys said you're sorry, whatever. Prince Albert dying is maybe the sole thing that distracts the rage of the London papers and the parliament from actually intervening on the south side of the south. It's a very interesting historical tidbit. Why is it a terrible thing? Because for the south, because that's their greatest opportunity. That's their opportunity for Yorktown or Saratoga or whatever, and it passes, and they'll never get close again ever. I remember Franco from called the British and said, hey, you have Prince Albert in Canada at that point. The British. Is your, uh, yeah, is your, is your uh, fridge still running? You better go catch it. Exactly. <laughs> Um, so the trend of, yeah, you better let him out. Let's go. Let him out, Sophia. <laughs> let him be a free man already. Get him out of the can. Um, a farmer driving John Deere at sunset, working hard, hardworking man, blue collar worker, massive lip of tobacco in. You can't get more American than that. Uh, it's like the Star Spangled Banner played out on corn and lentils. The Trent Affair, that with the failure of the original man roast Yancey mission, that compels a total shift in Confederate diplomacy, okay? This is super important. So we're gonna end the class today because I have a meeting. Did I mention I have a meeting here? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, the original Confederate plan was what? King Cotton, King Cotton, King Cotton. The original Confederate international plan was literally the three rules of real estate, right? Just so obnoxious. Mm -hmm. I always think they're going to see something different. Location, I'm waiting for the two. They're like, location, location, location. You're annoying, 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 realtors. <laughs> <laughs> it really is that, like, just King Cotton, King Cotton, King Cotton. You can be an arrogant, fill in your favorite expletive. You have, can have no diplomatic things. You cannot even read. Doesn't Reading is optional. If you have 85% of cotton imports, oh, wait, bumper crop, it's actually stacked, Egypt, Algeria, India. When that fails, and when the Trent Affair washes over, again, mad props to Lincoln. He, he, he diffuses it. He's like, you want me to apologize, Victoria? I'll apologize. You want me to, uh, you know, release the prison? You got it. You want me to watch the young Victoria on Netflix? I'll watch it. We'll watch it together. Uh, so he released the Confederate? Uh, yeah, he told Wilkes, he told Wilkes, he called, he texted him. He's like, dude, what? He wrote WTF in his text. <laughs> and Wilkes is like, what? But you wrote back WT. And Lincoln's like, WTF is wrong with you. Release those men. And then he's like, you add, make me do that again. I'm going to come bust some heads. And Lincoln was pretty like vicious on, on Twitter. <laughs> he was like in his text. He's good texting game. In the beginning, it seems like he was soft. Then towards the end, he had. Yeah, Lincoln, I mean, again, love him or hate him. Like Lincoln definitely Catholic value of perseverance, not quitting and like continue. I mean, he done. Yeah, for better or for worse. Again, I'm not going to tell you what to feel about him, but he does like keeps going and even when he's in the pit of depression we're gonna talk about this before the victory of atlanta sherman and he's like i'm definitely not getting reelected um and then sherman delivers atlanta and he crushes he wins like 220 to 10 electoral votes just destroys but lincoln was totally like yeah i'm screwed very stoic kind of like marcus aurelius confessions level like there's nothing i can do and we're at 
Um, even at that moment, he doesn't quit. He doesn't run away. You know, like he definitely stands his ground the whole time. Uh, okay, the Trent affair, the Trent affair, not going the way of the South, not getting Britain involvement, King Cotton failing, compels a shift in, in, in Southern policy. Here's where we're going in this class. From arrogant posturing, from on the offensive, cotton, 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 recognize us, to just please give us relief from the blockade. Mm -hmm. At this point, late 1861, the blockade mm -hmm. is starting to uh, bring its weight on uh, the South. In fact, a Southern bishop, a Catholic bishop, claimed, quote, it was unconstitutional as well as immoral, with the aim being to crush the South completely. All right, so we'll talk a lot. Of, this class is listed on... Vandal Catholic is Catholicism in the Civil War. Um, and that's not incorrect. Like it's, I mean, it's, it's a Civil War class. We're going to talk a lot about Catholic opinions. The Pope, I can't wait to, really, I'm so excited. Your reaction was so awesome, so real. Like, wow, like I've never heard, have you ever heard of that before? Good. No, that, that's really, that's awesome. So I can't wait to read the, the letters. Between, there's a lot between Davis and his envoys and the Pius IX and all that. We're going to talk a lot about Catholicism in this class and a lot of what the different bishops thought. Um, two bishops, Lynch of South Carolina, he's, he's not appointed as a Catholic envoy. He's appointed as a straight envoy. Davis is like, your Confederate patriotism is actually scaring me. I'm the Confederate president. You're too extreme for me. Just represent the Confederacy. You don't have to pretend you're a bishop. I know you're a legit bishop. Just go as like, you're, you're really terrifying me now. Please calm down. You're making me want to join the union. Like, uh, which was like crazy pro-Confederate. Whereas Archbishop Hughes of New York City, he was, like, he's, he was an envoy for Lincoln's government. So Catholics are involved on in both sides. What, what did Catholics think about the war? It basically was like, where did you live? Catholics in the North, by and large, support the Union in the South, the Southerners. Um, not true for Catholic newspapers in the North, who often were very viciously anti-Lincoln. People like James McMaster, who Lincoln puts in jail like 600 times for saying bad things about him, for violating speech codes on Twitter and Facebook, that kind of community guidelines. Um, all right, you guys are all the best. Astons, Betsy Johnson, Schmitz, coolest people in the world of all time, ever. More compliments, more <laughs> sweetness. I'll, we'll pick up this on Monday. I'm actually very happy about the stopping point we're at because we've covered the internationalism through Trent. And now we're going to be able to pick up very nicely uh, with the domestic stuff we covered last time. So I wish you all a wonderful, beautiful weekend. I know it's two days away, but I want to see you till Monday. And uh, thank you all very, very much. Take care. Are we still